Hello and welcome to this special edition of this customer community update. I'm Javed Mohammed, your host and community manager, and I'm very honored to have with us Chris Weisopal, who is the co-founder and CTO of Vericode. Chris, welcome. Hi, Javed. Good to be here with you. Likewise. Thank you so much for making the time. It's the beginning of 2023, and I thought it'd be great to kind of get your insights um, into what's going on in the application security space. Um, I know you've got this amazing crystal ball, and I thought we'd kind of get you to look into it. So without sure. further ado, uh, yeah, uh, let's get right into it. So what do we need to know, Chris, uh, you know, for the coming 12 months in terms of, uh, you know, to ensure a brighter future for the, to make a, to make secure software? Yeah. So when I, when I look, you know, forward for the next 12 months, I like to look backward for the last, you know, 24, 36 months because, you know, nothing happens overnight in, in, in uh, application security, you know, problems need to be discovered, um, uh, tools need to be built. Um, and then the longest part is customers need to adopt them and integrate them into the way they're, they're building their software. And so, uh, especially that last one can, can take quite a while. Um, so, you know, as an example, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of supply chain, uh, capabilities added to um, to to uh, people building software added to their pipelines, but you know this that that trend that need for that really started years ago. Um, it really started with um, some really bad supply chain attacks, like the Solar Winds attacks. You know, supply chain attacks aren't new, but in um, you know 2020 they became you know more numerous and more severe. And that's when it kind of triggered, hey, we got to do something about this, right, mm -hmm. um, to the federal government. And, um, and so what the do something about it actually was the Biden cybersecurity order in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next year went by with, you know, coming up with what are the standards going to be? What are the processes going to be by organizations by like OMB and NIST? Um, and then now in 2023, we're going to start to see the federal government implementing some of these supply chain um, requirements on their vendors and commensurate with that vendors are now starting to implement what they're going to need to do to satisfy the government's supply chain security requirements. So, you know, it's, it's almost easy to predict now we're going to be seeing people doing a lot more supply chain testing and, uh, and, and also, um, you know, sharing with their their customers some evidence of their supply chain testing, um, but that was like years in the making. So it's it's kind of easy to, to predict now in 2023. It almost seems like a foregone conclusion, like it's not even a prediction um, anymore. And so that that's kind of the way I, I think about a lot of these things, because um, you know, to some degree, progress in application security is a lot slower than 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 we all would hope. Mm -hmm. I find it very interesting when you mentioned that you look backwards to look forward. So it's a very, very uh, interesting uh, insight. So, so there's a lot going on, and I'm just kind of curious. Like from a, a you know, you, you obviously you mentioned about the software supply chain. So you know, there's a lot of talk about S bomb and some mm -hmm. of the, a lot of buzzwords that are floating around. And I'm just kind of curious to get your take on like what are some of these uh, emerging technologies and trends. Yeah, sure. So I would say, you know, SBOM is another example of something that had been percolating in the Department of Commerce um, for 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 many years. And then when the Biden cybersecurity order came out, it just became like everyone's got to do it. And so, like, I think last year was like the year of SBOM. Everyone talked to SBOM, SBOM, SBOM. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how are we going to create them? How are we going to exchange them? What are, what are, what are we going to do with them? Um, and, and so SBOMs are traditionally created with a technology called software composition analysis, mm -hmm. which can take a, you know, a set of source code in a repo, or it can actually look at a binary in, in a lot of cases, depending on the technology, and look through that, that code, whether it's binary or software, and discover what third-party libraries are being used. Like, is this a publicly known 
identifiable, identifiable library. And if that's true, what version is, is it? And then, you know, the reason we're doing this is because every version of every library has some vulnerabilities in it. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, let's see if that has any severe vulnerabilities in it. And if it does, that's, you know, that's not acceptable, right? I, I don't want, I don't want, my, I don't want my vendor giving me code that has this critical vulnerability in it. Mm -hmm. So the SBOM is a way to determine that. We see software composition analysis as a, as a technology that Veracode provides as other vendors out there that can generate these SBOMs uh, for vendors to give to their customers mm -hmm. um, or just to manage their own risk internally. Um, one use case I've seen is um, a lot of times a library is used in many, many applications across an organization. And if you realize that, you can say, hey, why don't we just go everywhere and update this library? It's a way to fix a lot of bugs quickly. Okay. Um, the other technology I, 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 when I talk about supply chain SBOM is container scanning. I was just going to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So containers uh -huh. um, are almost all open source code, right? Because uh -huh. you can download a container from a container repo, a public, can, publicly available container that's got open source in it. You end up putting in other applications. A lot of times those are open source. You put your applications in there, which is, has your first party code and open source libraries. So you got to look through the entire container, all the different layers, um, and look for those open source packages um, in order to understand what risks are in that container. So that's become quite popular to scan your containers in development before you go into production. And, and Veracode recently um, you know, released a product to do this. I'm, I'm kind of curious when you're speaking there, Chris. I mean, containers have been around for a while. Why is there like this seems like there seems a, a big delay between new technologies coming kind of becoming mainstream and then as addressing those from a security standpoint? Any any insights into that? Yeah. So um when containers first came out, I, I first, you know, started talking to CISOs and they started saying, you know, we need to know. I don't know what's in the container. Like this scares me. Mm -hmm. Um, this is like unknown risk. And this is the worst thing for a CISO, because the CISO's job is not to secure everything, but it's at least to manage the risk. So having visibility into a technology that their company is using is important. Mm -hmm. um, and it took a few years before the first startup companies, the first innovators came up with container scanning. Um, and then I think it's matured now. So AppSec vendors like Veracode now are, are, are making it part of their suite of tools that developers will use during de the development process. So they're actually designed for developers now where that first generation was really designed for security security mm -hmm. professionals, okay. the CISO's team. Okay, well, thanks for sharing that. Now, if, if with that, I think it becomes incumbent upon me to ask you about something which is uh, um, jargon that's certainly out there a lot in the news and that's chat GPT, right? It's just getting oh, yeah. a lot of coverage. And I'm just curious. I mean, it sounds like it's the wonder drug for, for, for the day. It can do anything and everything. And I'm just curious, what's your take on it from a, what, what do you think it will do in the application security space? Yeah, it kind of burst on the stage in December um, when the, when the beta became available mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, everyone on Twitter was using it. I was trying it out. And then I think like a few, uh, about a week later, it started to hit the mainstream and newspapers started to put articles out about it. Uh -huh. And, you know, people are saying it's potentially like uh, a bigger, you know, a bigger shock to the tech ecosystem than uh -huh. Google search was really the first good search engine. Um, and, 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 and it's, 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 it's of that level of impact on how it's going to impact how we use technology um, every day. And, you know, through, you know, personally or in, in our, in our jobs, and, and so what I'm seeing is, you know, this is this is automating a lot of basic things that you would do with with text, right? Um, that's text is really the lingua franca of 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 doing almost everything in business. You know, uh -huh. we're doing a video now, but I mean, for each video, you know, I think I probably read 50 documents today, right? Wow. Um, so you know, there's just email and the way we communicate is text and. And so that's oftentimes 
an attack vector. Um, or it's the way that we interact with technology like code, um, mm -hmm. debugging, configuration files. Um, so, so chat GPT allows att both attackers and defenders to do, to automate some of their work. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so an example would be, you know, a, a, uh, an attacker doing a phishing campaign needs to come up with phishing messages and maybe they want them really targeted towards different organizations. Well, that used to be a manual, a manual job. So I'm going to go in and create a new phishing email, tweak it, customize it, and then, you know, try to attack an organization with it. Now with technology like ChatGPT, that can be, that can be automated. You know, you can say ChatGPT, make me a phishing email that would, you know, trick someone at, you know, company X that they're getting a package from, you know, FedEx today and they need, they need to fill out a form. Uh -huh. um, and, and chat GPT could, could create that. Now they're going to put some guardrails in there so that it doesn't do a lot of these illegal behaviors, but that doesn't mean that, you know, other AIs are going to, are going to, are going to do that. That's, you know, this is just chat GPT is one particular company's mm. um, AI. So I think it's going to automate, be, be attackers are going to be able to automate some of the things they're doing, but I think defenders are going to be able to automate uh, some of the jobs they're doing because a lot of it is processing text. Like an example is someone in a, in a, in a uh, secure, secure operations center mm -hmm. looking at an alert and understanding, is this a real issue, a false positive, looking at it in the context of the organization's environment, deciding what to do, and then doing something like maybe quarantining a system or, or mm -hmm. setting new firewall rules or something like that. You know, that's where technology like ChatGPT can be used to automate on the defender's side. Mm -hmm. So I think it is going to change um, both attack and defense over the next couple of years. Okay. So it seems like it's going to be a, a boon for the black hats and a, and hopefully a, a, even a better boon for the white hats. We'll see, we'll see how it plays out. We'll, we'll have to see. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. So in terms of like, just like, how can organizations be kind of be better prepared um, you know, to uh, equip to address some of these challenges of, you know, complex s software security issues. Sure. So, um, you know, the way I look at, you know, an organization trying to deal with complex software security issues, and that complexity is like, you know, the the rule of the day. Things things are just getting more and more complex. We're stitching together more and more black boxes, like open mm -hmm. source APIs we're decomposing our applications into all these different microservices. We're using infrastructure as code and all these APIs from our web um, cloud, from our cloud providers. Um, and, and, you know, that, that allows us to go fast, but we're really stitching together all these pieces and we don't really know what the unintended consequences are, um, the side effects mm -hmm. and the hidden behaviors that, that happen when we make this complex software. So we really have to try to have as many processes as we can to, to analyze either you know, code repos or uh, binaries or running applications. Really, we need multiple techniques along the whole development pipeline to really, to really help with this issue. And you need, you need observability and protection um, mm -hmm. happening in happening in, 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 in production. So there's no silver bullet. It's usually a lot of different pieces um, that you that you need to you need to put together. But you know, everyone can't do everything. You know, that gets expensive just with the purchasing the technology, running the technology, people dealing with it. Um, so what you do to secure your complex system really has to do with the level of risk that that system is um, uh, has. So for example, on one end of the spectrum, low level of risk, maybe a mobile game where the worst thing that can happen is, you know, one individual's phone can be taken over or maybe just PII can be leaked versus software that's going into, you know, like a military system, like a nuclear submarine or, you know, perhaps a, power a nuclear plant. power plant. Uh -huh. Yeah. So there's lots of critical systems that are running software that really disastrous things can happen um, if, if, if there's a failure. So, you know, on one end of the spectrum, you might just be doing some basic things like some static analysis, some SCA for looking at your third party um, um, vulnerabilities. On the other end of the spectrum, with critical software, 
you're doing things like threat modeling, you're doing static analysis, dynamic analysis, software composition analysis, you're doing container scanning, you are doing infrastructure as code scanning, and then you're monitoring all that in production, you're doing it continuously, and you're also going to have a high, a, a lower threshold for risk. You're going to fix those medium issues, uh, medium severity issues, where you might not be fixing medium severity issues in, um, you know, say the mobile gaming app. So mm -hmm. it's really commensurate with the risk um, you're doing. But the important thing is, you know, everyone needs an AppSec program. It's just how intensive is it? How, what's your policy? Um, mm -hmm. You know, how, 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 how severe flaws are you willing to let go into production? Mm -hmm. um, those are the, those are the, those are the knobs I see people um, turning in order to, you know, have a practical program. Okay, uh, so and you talked about the various kind of you know scanning uh, the, the technologies that are out there. Anything else, just from a from a tools perspective, in terms of what people need and why? Yeah, so I, I think it's not necessarily a tool, but it's it's really a technology that we're seeing a lot more organizations use is 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 upping their game on developer training. Mm. Um, in the past, it's really been kind of compliance oriented. People need to do e-learning. Developers need to pass a, a, a you know a software security principles class, a one-hour, two-hour class, watching videos and 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 um, you know doing doing uh, tests at the end. Um, we're seeing that uh, organizations are shifting more towards um, something which is a more lab-based approach, more hands-on, more like what a developer actually does in their day-to-day, -day, which is write some code test some code, write some code, debug some code, fix some code. Um, and, and so the lab environment allows the developer to learn doing those things like looking at a real application in a virtual machine, understanding how to attack that application, looking at the code, seeing those vulnerable patterns, how the attack is working, um, and then realizing how to fix the code and then attacking it again and seeing that the, the exploit doesn't work. So um, that's that's a technology that I see gaining a lot more traction over the next year. Okay, well, thanks for sharing that. So, uh, Chris, I mean, I know it's a very broad space in terms of application security and just trying to share some of these uh, insights. Is there something I should have asked you and I didn't? Yeah, so I guess the, the other thing, which is sort of like supply chain, the, it's, it's getting buzzwordy, but it's important and it's not new, but it's really getting traction now is the concept of zero trust. And it's, again, I think it's coming out of the Biden uh, cybersecurity executive order, which essentially said, you know, federal agencies need to have a zero trust cybersecurity architecture um, by, um, I think by the end of 2024. So you start to see a lot of cybersecurity vendors organizing their products to work um, hand in hand to create a zero trust um, in, environment. And, you know, really what zero trust is, is, is basically understanding every entity that's working in the system, whether it's a device or, or an end user and making sure it only has the privileges it needs and that that's tested continuously. So you need to really understand who the identity, what the identities and devices are, make sure they're operating with the least privilege and continuously um, monitor that. So some of the models I've seen um, are coming out of NIST and DHS maturity models, and they have five pillars, identity, um, device, uh, network, um, application, and data. And, and you really need to have, a, have zero trust principles around each one of those five pillars. Um, there's really the only, the only thing that I see is people really start with identity because it's something that um, you really kind of need to have first in order to do the rest. Uh -huh. um, but then people need to mature all of those different pillars um, because if they don't, if they ignore a pillar, then that can be used to bypass the other one. So for example, if you ignore application security, then if there's vulnerabilities and that the compromise happens, an attacker can take over the identity of the application, the privileges of the application, maybe can decrypt the data the application has access to. So even if you're doing things like strong identity and um, encrypting your data on the network and at rest, um, ignoring the application pillar 
can can uh, can 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 still lead to breakdown of your zero trust architecture. So what I'm seeing is most organizations are fairly mature around their identity. And in 2023, we're going to start to see them get more mature in the other pillars, including um, what I like to call the the forgotten pillar, because the application pillar often gets ignored mm -hmm. uh, because people just don't understand it. Um, but I, I think we're going to start to see more understanding of the application pillar and how that how zero trust plays into application security in 2023. Okay, well, thanks for sharing that. As you were speaking, I was just thinking, you know, you were talking about pillars, but I'm just thinking of the other metaphor of uh, again a chain just being as strongest as its weakest link. So yeah, uh, yeah. I guess the pillar is is sort of like you need the pillars to hold up the roof, and if you're missing exactly. a pillar, um, you're going to have a problem. Exactly. <laughs> So Chris, I, you know, just to kind of wrap things up, I actually, when I was preparing for the interview, I went back and looked at the predictions we did for 2022. Uh, and one of the things we touched upon was cryptocurrency. Uh, and again, just for the benefit of everyone, Chris didn't make any technology, any financial predictions, uh, but it was more about the technology on the back end. So what a year 2022 has been. Any thoughts, insights? Yes. I mean, it's been a, a disastrous year for cryptocurrency. You know, there's been billions of dollars stolen through um, bugs in these different cryptocurrency systems, wallets, bridges, smart contracts. Those get exploited. And if they're not detected soon enough, um, you see you see a lot of money being being stolen by by attackers. And we saw a lot of that. In, in in 2023 in 2022 and i i expect to see more of it in 2023 i i don't think really anything has substantially changed um you know cryptos uh cryptocurrency systems are very what i i call brittle whereas you know a any small bug is almost really devastating if a small bug can be used to steal you know one bitcoin um, it ends up siphoning all the Bitcoin that's available mm. uh, to the system, um, which can be quite disastrous. We've seen breaches upwards of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and unfortunately, it's hard to make perfect code, right? We can make code really good. Uh, and, and I think um, all these people building the software that goes into these crypto systems have to do more due diligence on more testing, more reviews, more threat modeling. Um, as they're building than they are now. It's never going to be perfect. And that's one of the sort of failures of, of, of these crypto systems. Um, you're going to make it harder to find a bug, but there's still going to be a bug there. If someone finds it, they're going to siphon all the money. Um, so the other thing that I, I think that these systems need to do is put anomaly detection in where they can detect when these bad events are happening because they the money can be siphoned very quickly. Um, and so... That has to be detected really quickly and the controls have to be in place to, to sort of pull the plug. But I, I think we're going to see a lot more of those attacks in 2023. Mm. On that and on that slightly sadder note, but there's always hope. <laughs> yeah. You get things in play. Chris, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Uh, I want to thank our community for joining uh, and I hope to be back with Chris, as well as uh, some of our other internal experts and folks from the community, um, our champions. Thank you. Uh, have a great 2023. I've got to get, I have to get used to saying that. Uh, and uh, all the best. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Javan. It was great, uh, great talking with you about what's coming the next year.